Good morning. Welcome to Centenary. Would you please stand? Our opening hymn is number 240, Hark the Herald Angels Sing. Would you remain standing and affirm our faith using the Apostles' Creed, which is found on 881 in your hymnal? 
I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. seated. At this time, I invite the Smith family to come forward for the lighting of the Advent candles. Hear these words from the prophet Isaiah. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. And expectation. Remembering God's promise to send a savior. As we relight the candle, Preparation and peace, we remember the voice crying out in the wilderness, Prepare ye the way of the Lord. Now, as we relight the candle of proclamation and joy, we remember our now we relight the candle of proclamation and joy. What's our name? May our hearts be forever filled with the joy of his coming. Let us pray. Father, we are filled with joy because we have hope and peace that you have sent your Son for all that believe. Help us to be the voices that proclaim grace and truth. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. <laughs> some announcements as we begin our time together this morning. I'd like to invite Gary right out to the front for a special announcement. Good morning. On the back of this is an announcement about Project 300. And it says Project 300 is, is inviting 300 people to come to Centenary. And then this is wrong because COVID knocked this out. We were going to do it in September, but now we're going to do it in the uh, uh, latter part of January and, and the first weekend in February. So that's what we're looking at. Real quick, just want to say this, 189 years, whoops. 189, 182 years ago, some people gathered to establish a church in the fall of 1839. 
They knew what we know today. They had to move out of their comfort zone and work hard to establish this new church, which was called Centenary Methodist Church. Patsy Crocker said she would work hard and contribute 25 cents. Dee Bryan said he would work hard and contribute $300. So today we find that we're in the fastest growing county in the United States, Johnston County. So just like in 1839, we need to reach out and help Centenary United Methodist grow. Please find this in your uh, bulletin. And if you would like to help us, go visit some people, invite them to come to Centenary, put your name down. Thank you very much. Thank you, Gary. Um, we do have some other announcements. Uh, while I am doing the other announcements, I want to go ahead and invite um, our children that are coming down for the children's moment. Y'all come on down front and I will be with you in just a moment. All right, MYF, we are having our Christmas party tonight at 5.30, so we look forward to seeing our youth for some reindeer games um, tonight at 5.30. Also, uh, next Sunday, we will have our Christmas cantata. Doesn't it feel wonderful to be saying those words? We are back to normal. We will have our Christmas cantata next Sunday, so there's no early service. We'll be gathering for Sunday school and at this time um, for the cantata next week. On Christmas Eve, we will have two worship services, one at 5 o'clock and one at 7 o'clock. Um, and anybody at all of any age can come to either service. They will both have a homily about Christmas. They will have candlelight. They will have communion. And so um, please make plans to join us on Christmas Eve at either 5 or 7 o'clock. We are still looking for some uh, bell ringers for the Salvation Army. There is a sign-up sheet. We need only two spots left. All right, there's a sign-up sheet on the table in the narthex. If you are interested, please go ahead and sign up for that ministry. Um, back to the Christmas Eve services, I meant to mention that this year at Christmas Eve, um, our offering that is collected at those services, um, the money will be going to support our Backpack Buddies ministry here at Centenary. So um, thank you for that in advance. And just a quick message from the finance office that if you would like a physical paper copy of your 2021 giving report, please contact Lindsay and let her know um, that you will not be logging in and printing one that you need to receive a paper copy. We are glad to do that for you. Just let us know in advance and she will work on that in January. Um, also, please locate the pew pad, sign your name and pass it along to your neighbors. The flowers on the altar this morning are given to the glory of God and in loving memory of Martha and Penn Montgomery, Ida and Larry Lawrence, and Bryant Wellens by Jimmy and Lillian Lawrence and their family. So we thank the Lawrences for these flowers. And the rose on the altar is in celebration of the birth of Dahlia Reed Jolliffe Houlihan, whose parents are Jimmy Jolliffe IV and Eleanor Houlihan, and great aunt is Catherine Jolliffe. So we celebrate the birth of this little girl with the Jolliffe family. All right, do you think that is all we have for announcements? Good morning. How are y'all doing today? All right, we are gonna play a game. Everybody got their listening ears turned on? We are gonna play Simon Says. How do we play Simon Says? Jane? Or, I'm sorry, Will, I called you by your brother's name. What do we do? You listen to the one who says Simon Says. All right, so you're going to listen to me. When I say Simon Says, you do what I say, okay? If you don't say Simon Says, then you don't do it. That's right, and if I don't say Simon Says, you're not supposed to do what I say. All right, so Simon Says, stand up. Simon Says, sit down. Simon says, touch your nose with your fingertip. All right, clap your hands. Uh-oh, there's a couple of you that got tripped up. Good job. Um, Simon says, tap your toes. Stop. <laughs> Some of you are still doing a good job tapping your toes. All right, Simon says, stop. Okay, good job with our game today. Now, how many of you like to play games? How many of you play a game sometime with somebody who doesn't follow the rules? Have you ever done that? 
Yeah, in our family, you've probably played with somebody who doesn't follow the rules. It's a chronic problem in our house. But is it, is it fun to play with someone who doesn't follow the rules? No. no, it takes all the fun out of the game. It takes all the good out of it, right? Well, today in church, Pastor Steve is going to be telling us a story about somebody who was very obedient, all right? Somebody who followed the rules even when the rules didn't make sense. And this person is Joseph. Do you all remember who Joseph was? Yeah, he, he was married to Mary, and he's Jesus' stepfather. And Joseph had to believe some really hard things, but he chose to believe them and to follow God's word and to trust in God. All right? And that is a really special thing that he did. So as we go through this week, I want us to think about when are some times that we need to be obedient like Joseph and we need to follow what God wants us to do. Will? Oh, thank you, buddy. We'll get that taken care of for you. No worries. All right, so we're going to work on listening for God and, and following his word in our lives. Okay, can you all repeat after me in our prayer? Yes. Dear, God, Dear God, thank you for loving us. Thank you for the example of Joseph. Help us, Help us. follow you. Like he, like he did. Amen. Amen. All right, you guys can go with Miss Rodney. Um, I want to be a Kelly. You flew for that. I know. I know, sweetie. Okay, we got Have fun. <laughs> <sighs> All right, let's see. I am so lost on where we are. Y'all notice we switched up the order of the bulletin while old dogs don't learn new tricks real well. And so I'm like completely lost today. It looks like we are at the offertory. So at this time, I'm going to invite our ushers to come forward that we might return to God a portion of that with which he has first blessed us. Be seated. <clears throat> As we enter into our time of prayer this morning, um, there are several prayer requests that I want to mention 
before you. Um, first of all, I would like to ask that you um, keep the people of Kentucky, those who have been impacted by the tornadoes and the storms um, in your prayers uh, at this time. I also ask that you keep the Whitley family in your prayer uh, prayers. Um, John and Witt's mom, Lois, entered the church triumphant, and so we pray for the Whitley family. We want to continue to be in prayer for Judy Blizzard. Um, we want to lift up Pim and Bev Hawkins. Um, Tony Hamilton continues to need prayers, Cindy Huntsbury. Um, and there were a couple of others this week, but I don't know that I have permission to say anything about them, but just be in prayer for this congregation and for those who are having health troubles and, and who need um, God's healing in their lives. And I feel like I'm forgetting someone, but um, if I am, please know that we are praying for them in our hearts. So let us pray. Almighty God, we come before you in this season of Advent anticipating the joy of Christmas. Lord, we come before you this morning having lit the candle of joy in the Advent wreath. And in many ways, our hearts are lifted up with your joy and with your praise. And yet, Lord, we also find that our hearts are, are in many places heavy and overburdened. And Lord, we, we hurt for many of those who are in our community who hurt this day as well. We pray for people in um, other states who have been impacted by these storms, who have lost loved ones, who have lost homes, who've lost their place of business. Lord, we ask that you continue to be with them on this long journey. Lord, we pray with those who have recently lost loved ones. We ask that you walk with them through the valley of the shadow of death. Lord, continue to be their light, be their shepherd, and grant to them your comfort and your peace. And Lord, we pray for those who are experiencing times of poor health. We ask that you place your hands upon them, fill them with your strength and your healing and your wholeness. Lord, we pray that as a community, we can wrap our arms around them, Lord, and just keep them in comfort and compassion. And Lord, we pray today for those for whom Christmas isn't always a season of joy, those for whom it, it brings up painful memories or difficult times, those who see it through a lens of grief, or keep us mindful of their needs as well. Lord, even as we continue to anticipate the birth of Jesus in a stable in Bethlehem, we anticipate his return to our hearts as always, Lord. And, and so we ask that you help us prepare our lives to receive Christ, prepare our hands and our feet to be yours in this world. Lord, fill us with your compassion and your courage and help us go forth. Help us share your word and your grace and your mercy this time and always. Lord, we pray all of this in the name of your Son, our Savior, who taught us to pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. This time I invite you to stand and sing together the first and second verse of hymn number 245, the first Noel. <laughs>
seated. The Old Testament lesson today comes from Isaiah chapter 63, verses 7 through 9. Hear the word of God. I will tell of the kindness of the Lord, the deeds for which he is to be praised according to all the Lord has done for us. Yes, the many good things he has done for the house of Israel according to his compassion and many kindnesses. He said, surely they are many people, sons who will not be false to me. And so he became their savior. In all their distress, he too was distressed and the angel of his presence saved them. In his love and mercy, he redeemed them. He lifted them up and carried them all the days of old. Yet they rebelled and grieved his Holy Spirit. Here ends the reading of the Word of God. May it be a blessing to all of us who have heard it.
Thank you for that choir. That meant a great deal to me in that undertone of O Come, O Come, Emmanuel at the end, Andrew, was just fascinating to me. Thank you. The gospel lesson for today comes from the book of Matthew, chapter 1, verses 18 through 25. Hear the word of God. This is how the birth of Jesus came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph, but before they came together, she was found to be with child through the Holy Spirit. Because Joseph, her husband, was a righteous man and did not want to expose her to public disgrace, he had in mind to divorce her quietly. But after he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. And all this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet, the virgin will be with child and will give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. And when Joseph woke up, he did what the angel of the Lord had commanded him and took Mary home as his wife, but he had no union with her until she had given birth to a son, and he gave him the name Jesus. Here ends the reading of the Word of God. May it be a blessing to all of us who have heard it. Let us pray. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, I do ask that the words of my mouth, that the meditations of our hearts and minds together, that they would be acceptable and pleasing in thy sight, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. The last time I spoke here in the church, I, I shared with the congregation that when I was a boy, I had lived in Israel when I was seven years old. And it was sort of a dark time, 1969, in that country, and I'd had quite a bad experience. The darkness was real, and uh, Christmas didn't look like it was going to happen. And yet, we went to Bethlehem, and uh, there in the Church of the Nativity, in the caves underneath, for the very first time, in the midst of the realities of my own darkness, uh, the light of Christ became a reality to me, and my faith was born. And so I went back to Israel as an adult in 1989, 20 years later, 30 years later, whatever it was. And um, when I went there 20 years later, um, I wanted to go back to Bethlehem, to this place where I'd had this experience as a child, where, where this faith of mine had really been born. And, and I wanted to buy an olive wood nativity. They make lots of carvings over there in Bethlehem to sort of commemorate that event. So I had done that, and it had been a great deal for me to, to have that. I still have it in uh, the parsonage and, and put it up every year. And, and since then, I've, I've got some for my sons so that they can have one as well, just like it, this memory from their childhood. But after we left Bethlehem, we went back to the old city of Jerusalem, which is still a very unique place to go. There's a modern Jerusalem, but there is still the old city of Jerusalem. And as you enter into those ancient gates uh, where three ma major religions come together, you can feel the tension in the air between the Muslims and the Jews and the Christians. And you have to, to go through this heavy security with armed guards standing by, and they check everything. And, and you go inside, and you can see the Wailing Wall where the Hasidic Jews are there praying before the one last part of the foundation of the temple that is left. And, and then when you go inside where the temple used to be, into the temple courtyard, instead of seeing the temple that was built to God, you see a Muslim mosque, the Dome of the Rock. And it's quite a shock to see that as a Christian pilgrim, you know? And so we went into this courtyard, and you're feeling all of this tension between all the religions. And, and I went over to where the Golden Gate was. You remember on Palm Sunday that, that Jesus came in on the donkey, and he, and he came through that Golden Gate into the city right there where the temple was as they shouted their hosannas. Well, as I was there that day, I noticed that, that where the gate was, they had bricked it up. 
And, and, and I talked to some of the armed guards that were there, and they said, the prophecy says that when Jesus comes back again, he's going to come through these gates. And I said, do you believe Jesus is coming back again? Well, no, we don't. But they had put Brock Walls up there, and they had 24-hour armed guards there just in case. Do you believe that Jesus is coming back again? Are you ready if he does? Do you believe that Jesus was the Christ, the Son of God, the Messiah, the Emmanuel, the one that was born to save us from our sins and our sorrows? That was the question that that wall bagged that day. And these were some of the same questions that many were asking on that first Christmas. And some of the people were forced to take an even closer look than others. Who do you believe this child to be? You see, Christianity begins with the story of Christmas. There's a great deal of diversity among the Christian churches and our practices from the Methodists and the Baptists to the Catholic and the Greek Orthodox. There are lots of different things that we do with our liturgy, but we are all joined together uh, by this one story, all of the churches united together and captivated by the drama of the birth of God in Jesus the Christ. I mean, we'd have to be captivated by it because we tell it every year in so many different ways over and over and over again. I mean, we tell it in our families. Many of you can remember maybe a grandfather or a father reading from the Gospel of Luke, and, and you can almost quote the text. You know, you've, you've never really memorized it, but when you hear, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy. For unto us is born in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. You know these words. They're in your heart. They've been there since childhood. And we sing this story in our carols every year. Isn't it good to sing the carols? You know, there's this thing where you're not supposed to sing too many carols before Christmas. But last year we missed it all. So I'm going to sing as many as we can this year. I mean, I love singing the carols. I might not be theologically correct, but it feels good to me. And, you know, you can go to a nursing home. And Andrew says we're not quite ready to go to the nursing home again and sing carols because of the pandemic. But it's amazing to me. You can go to that nursing home and you talk to these people that have dementia and are struggling with their memory. They can't remember who their children are. They can't remember their own name sometimes. And you can go in there. You watch. You try it again. And you can start singing, Oh, come all ye faithful, joyful and triumphant. And they join right in. Oh, come ye, oh, come ye to Bethlehem. Those words are deep inside of them as music has placed these words in their hearts and they know the story of Christmas. And then we told the story through the pageants and, and our, our children. We're not having a, a Christmas pageant this year with the children. It, it hurts me as a pastor, I'm telling you. And it's not because we don't get to see our children up here performing as they usually do. It's because when they participate in that pageant, we put the story of Christmas in their hearts and they never forget it. What parts did you play when you were a child? I mean, there were lots of years. Any of you ever be Mary? Ever, were, you, were you ever Joseph? They never asked me to be Joseph. You know, you know, were you a shepherd or were you one of the three wise men? What parts did you play? The innkeeper? The mean old innkeeper? Now, I remember one year my brother and our, my best friend were the three, the three wise men, you know. We were carrying in the gold and the frankincense and myrrh. And we were supposed to sing... We three kings of Orient are bearing gifts. We travel so far, you know. And they both chickened out, my brother and the other guy. And so I was up there just singing by myself. Felt like the 830 service here at Centenary, you know. <laughs> yeah. but, but the pageants take this story and they put them in our hearts and we tell it over and over again and and the nativity scenes i mean this nativity scene right here is usually out there in, in the vestibule or north x i'm not sure what we call it here 
and um, all year long, and some of the main Christmas are there. And at Christmas, we bring it out and put it right on the altar, and, and we bring the Christmas up. It's an important part of our worship here at the church. Each one of them a representation of God um, and His presence with us. And, and then we have out there in the history cabinet, you know, all of those nativity scenes, and we put our own out there for everyone to see. And maybe you've even done it out in the churchyard before. You ever done that? You know, played a shepherd and a sheep on a cold winter's night, shivered out there in the cold. We tell the story over and over and over again. It's because we're captivated by its drama and we're held by the story and it's in us. It's the foundation and the beginning of our faith. And the Christmas story is powerful because the coming of the Christ The Emmanuel occurs during the telling of another miracle, the miracle of human birth. I mean, who has it when they have seen a newborn child cradled in its mother's arms, experienced some of the wonder uh, of God's presence and love? And if you've had the experience of holding your own child for the first time in your arms, I mean, it's hard to express, isn't it? Don't you feel that it's a miracle from God when you hold that child? Isn't that what you felt? And so at Christmas time, the holy baby and the mother rightly take naturally the center of our attention. And we, we put them right there yeah, first, the mother and the child. I keep care of my, my mom. She's um, turning 80 this year. I've kept care of her for about 25 years, all the details of her life and so forth. And she's in a facility in Durham, assisted living. And uh, she, uh, she always wants me to write her her Christmas card. And, uh, you know, and she wants me to get her her Christmas cards. And she wants to decide which card she wants to get. And when I talk to her about what cards do you want, mom? She'll say, I want want something religious, Stephen. She called me Stephen. And uh, I'll say, well, that sounds good, mom. And uh, she'll say, you know, I know what I want. I want the Madonna and child. That's what I want. I mean, and so I'll pull out the box that I've already bought of the Madonna and child. I'll say, how about these? And she'll say, those look really good, Stephen. I think I'd like those. I mean, the, the, the mother and child take center stage in the story of Christmas, don't they? But surrounding the mother and child we cannot forget that there are co-stars and subplots and that they need our attention too. And so, you know, if we're going to truly believe in this birth of the babe, the Emmanuel, God with us, we need to discover all the ins and outs of the story. And so we go all the way back to Elizabeth and Zechariah and, and that they're going to bring in John the Baptist who will prepare the way for God to end the world. And, and, and Megan will preach on, on old John and his sermon, you brood of vipers who warns you to flee from the wrath of God. And then we even go to Simeon and Anna. You know, after his birth where he's dedicated this prophet and prophetess who said that the Lord had promised that the child would be born. And and we go to the wise men who follow the star in the east and old terrible Herod that is going to, you know, try to take the child's life. That's an awful story. And we even go to, of course, the shepherds out there in the fields keeping watch over their flocks by night. And the angels who come, the animals, the donkey who will carry Mary, the oxen who is lowing in the background, the sheep that are with the shepherd, those those oriental animals, those camels who come from the east. We know all the characters. Wait a minute. Seems like I left somebody out. We got Jesus and the mother, right? The one character that often gets left out of the whole story. The one character that we rarely talk about is old Joseph. The earthly father of the one who was to be born. In fact, if you're doing a Christmas play, you know, Rodney knows this. If you're going to get somebody to play Joseph, you get the tall, quiet boy, you know. I mean, he's not going to have to do anything because the director's going to say, now you're Joseph, so you just stand here in the background and be quiet. 
You can knock real hard on the door to the inn, but it's the innkeeper that's going to say, sorry, no room. I mean, he doesn't even need any speaking parts. Just stand there and be quiet. So you get that introverted boy that's tall and, and shot up so quick, and he plays the part of Joseph. But I believe that Joseph has a story to tell, a story of the power of Jesus to bring justice and righteousness and salvation to the world. And I wonder why we set him to the side of the nativity. Maybe, maybe it's because of the indelicate nature of the problem he faced when he was confronted with the you know, pregnancy of Mary. I mean, maybe it's easier just to set him to the side instead of looking at his problem. I mean, what was Joseph thinking when Mary came to him and said, I'm pregnant, and there was this angel and the power of the Most High. I mean, what's he thinking? I've tried to put myself in his shoes. And, you know, I think that, that he really loved this girl. Man, he loved her. And he, he knew that she loved him, too. I mean, he knew that. I think, I think it was a love story. That's just what my heart tells me. I mean, they knew each other. They loved each other. They, they couldn't wait to get married. And so I don't think he thought maybe the worst I think maybe if it was me, I would have thought it was one of those Roman soldiers forced himself on her. Now she's afraid to tell me because if she tells me, she knows what I'm going to do and I'm liable to get hurt. Maybe that's why she's not telling me. She needs to tell me. But she wouldn't. She stuck to her story. An angel came to me and he said that the power of the Most High was going to overshadow me and that I was going to give birth to a child and that I should call him Jesus. Now, the law was very clear in these circumstances. You know, it, you know, there was a child that was going to be born out of wedlock. And so the mother was to be brought out into the street and stoned to death. It was a law of mercy in a hard land where subsistence living was how they all lived and where there was no welfare. And so the fabric of society was the family. It's the way you survived. And you could not, you could not attack the fabric of the family. And so their laws were harsh. Marriage and betrothal was uh, the beginning of a trust-building activity between the families and between the couples. And what a deep wound the news was to Joseph, by the society, it would have seen, be seen as something that was evil. And so perhaps it's good that Joseph remains silent in Matthew's gospel. But Matthew, but Matthew tells us that Joseph was a just man. And at first he decides, at the very first, what he decides he's going to do is he's going to break this relationship with Mary quietly. I mean, he loves her. And so he can't let this terrible thing happen to her. And so he's going to do this thing kind of behind the scenes, and he's going to let them take Mary off into the country with the rest of her family, and she'll have that baby out there, and, and, and nobody will ever know that child will be mixed in with all the other kids. But there's going to be a cost to Joseph. Because you know how it is in a small town? People talk just a little bit. Sometimes they think they know what they're saying, but they've got the story all wrong. And his decision will cost him. It'll cost him in his business. It'll cost him in his reputation. He will never be able to get married. He will never have a family because of the decision that he is about to make. But it is a new kind of justice, a new kind of justice apart from the law. It's a kind of justice where mercy is right there in the center, even before the birth of Jesus we see his mercy. And another reason it's hard to believe is because it's hard to take Joseph seriously to, to believe him, you know, because this angel comes to him and, and then Joseph so easily believes, you know. Now, I had a professor in seminary and he asked us one day, it was a Bible class, he said, who's the most unbelievable character in all the Bible? Somebody said, Samson with his hair, you know. Makes him strong, they cut it, makes him weak. That's just kind of weird, you know. I don't know about Samson. And, uh, 
And so he talked about the Nazarite vow a little bit and set yourself apart. And anyway, and then he said, well, what about, somebody said, what about, you know, the Jonah and the whale story? Three, three days in the belly of the whale. And someone said, well, the one that really gets me is Balaam's donkey. You know, Balaam's donkey, where the donkey warns Balaam not to go forward. And the donkey actually speaks. That one never bothers me. I mean, the Lord called me to be a minister and speak for him. So, I mean, figure if he could use me, he could use a donkey. So, it doesn't bother me too much. And the professor said, you know, none of those stories are all that unique. If you study literature and history, there are lots of places where they talk about whales swallowing people and people like Balaam's donkey talking and, and somebody's hair that makes them strong. Lots of places in literature and, and, and us understanding. But there is nowhere in all of history in any writing where someone believed what Joseph believed. Nowhere is there anything written like that. Joseph believed that Jesus was the Christ born to his virgin wife. And it's hard to believe because Joseph so easily believed in Mary's virtue and that Jesus was the Christ. And where's his evidence? I mean, there's no paternity test here. It's in a dream. That's it. He has a dream. Now, I have lots of dreams. Some of them seem more important than others. I even have some daydreams. But wow, against all evidence, except the evidence of a dream, Joseph chose to believe. You know, the angel came to him and he said, what Mary has said is true. Don't be afraid to take Mary as your wife. And when that baby is born, you name him Jesus. Yeah, Jesus means the one who saves. And he is going to save us all, for he is God with us. And to have faith in Mary's Faithfulness is what the angel tells him to do. But there's more to it than that even. Joseph not only believes, but he makes a commitment. He's not only going to believe in Mary, he has chosen to be the child of this baby and to help raise this ch child and, and to keep him safe. And so in faith, Joseph makes this commitment and his commitment turns his faith into the transformation of his life. And so Christ, still unborn, claims his first soul. Jesus claims his first soul before he's even born. And the soul that he claims is the soul of Joseph. And who else could this child have been but the Son of God? Oh, Joseph made an important choice. He chose to believe in Mary's virtue he chose to believe the words of the angel in his dream. He chose to name Jesus, Jesus, the one who brings salvation. And Joseph chose to receive that salvation for himself. And that choice brings him great joy. Can you picture Joseph kneeling there beside the cradle? There in the manger, can you see him there? When he's looking at that baby, he believes and knows that he's looking at the Son of God. Perhaps he's heard the angels singing in the distance and the proclamation of the shepherds and the kings who come. And now it's time for us to choose what we believe do we believe that Jesus Christ is coming back again? Do we believe that Jesus can enter into our conundrums, our hurts, our doubts, our fears, our, our, our ways that people have broken their promises to us? Do we believe that he can enter into those very things that are broken in our lives and use even those events through the transformation of his love into the thing that brings us our salvation? That's what he did for Joseph. Enter right into the thing that he doubted the most and use it to save his soul. Do you believe God can do that for you this year? Do you think he can be born again into your heart, into our community, into our world? Sometimes God enters into the darkest moments, and that's where he transforms us. 
when I was a boy living there in Israel, I said it was sort of dark times, and people didn't really want us there until they found out that the government contractors were there for their defense, and then things began to change. But before that happened, I remember my little sister came home with my mom from the bread store. They about two blocks away from the Mediterranean, and there was a bread store there. And she was crying. And my brother was eight, and I was seven. We were about the same size. And my little sister was three. And boy, she was crying. We said, Mom, what happened? He said, do you know this boy? He's about 12 years old. We knew who he was. Boy, he had been giving us a hard time. He was a bully. You know, he was a punk. We, you know, we didn't like that guy at all. He said, well, when we came out of the bread store, he pushed your little sister down. I mean, three years old. I said, did what? Now, my little sister really wasn't hurt, but my mom used to make all of her dresses back then, you know, and dress her like a doll, and she would have those little socks with lace that she turned down and patent leather shoes. And the reason she was crying is because her socks got dirty and her shoes got scuffed, you know. I mean, she wasn't really hurt, but, but this guy had pushed our little sister. I mean, what are you going to do? If somebody pushes your little sister down, three years old, we did what we were supposed to do, you know. We marched right on down to that bread store. He was 12, and we were only seven and eight, but we'd been practicing on one another for years. You know what I mean? <laughs> we grabbed that boy off the porch and held him down and started giving him what for. I mean, he didn't have a chance against the McElroy brothers, you know. <laughs> the bread baker came out, and he broke up the fight. He said, you guys get out of here and sent the other boy the other way. Well, he went and got all of his Jewish friends. And we went and got our few Christian friends. And we started throwing rocks at each other. There's rocks everywhere over there. That's why they throw them all the time. And they hurt when they hit you, I'm telling you. And it wasn't some sort of child's game. I mean, we were trying to hurt each other, you know. And we had to be careful. There was just a few of us. But I met that boy in the field back where that big dead tree was. And I had a big old stick. And he had a rock. I figured he could just hit me once. You know what I mean? And, and so I was ready to bash him. I mean, I was going to go right for his noggin, you know? And he dropped his rock. And he reached into his pocket. And he pulled out three coins. He dropped, they were called. Corrugated around the edge. Felt like ten. They were so light took four of them to make a penny and he gave me those three coins it's all he had in the world and I reached in my pocket I had a dollar bill my grandmother had given me for my birthday it was like a prize you didn't spend that you know you just kept that dollar and I pulled it out and I gave it to that boy and he put his arm around me and we walked out of the field and the other kids came and suddenly there was peace among the war between the Christians and the Jewish children in Herzliya in 1969. And the Prince of Peace had come into the midst of the conflict and somehow brought the gift of his love. It was a, mercy. It was a miracle. That's what happened to Joseph. God came into the midst of his hurt and his fears transformed his life and brought him salvation. And that's what God wants to do in our world once again. He wants to enter into your heart, into your hurt, into your struggle and bring the light of his love and transform the things that hurt the most. He wants to do that in, in our community, in our world. And he is coming back again. Can you see Joseph kneeling there before Jesus Knowing, knowing that he is the Son of God. That's my prayer for each one of you in this Christmas season. Is that as you bow before the King of Kings, that you know he is indeed the Lord of Lords. This is the word of God for the people of God this day. Amen. I'll invite you, if you will, to turn in your hymnal to number... 218, and let's stand and sing, It Came Upon a Midnight Clear. Number 218. <laughs>
worship during the Advent season to sing those carols. Receive this benediction. And now may the grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and the love of God and the presence of the Holy Spirit be with you now and always, world without end. Amen. Thank you.